God is good. Amen. Amen. Well, with it officially being spring, we've got a little bit of taste of spring weather. Uh, anybody going outside, enjoying some more outdoor activities? Uh, maybe working on the yard, taking a walk, going by, for a bike ride. I remember uh, when the kids were like, hey, can we ride our bikes to the playground at, at Mann's Elementary, which is uh, just a few blocks off. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we used to do that. You know, I kind of forgot about, you know, taking family bike rides. And, and I really enjoy it. Uh, anybody here uh, willing to admit that uh, they go for a run? Anybody willing to admit they go for a run? Okay, there's a couple shy people, all right, that go, go for a run. You, you know what the Bible says about going for a run? It says this in Proverbs 28, the wicked flee though no one pursues. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of, uh, now to be honest, right, this is talking about uh, people that are guilty, and when you're guilty, you always think someone's chasing you, uh, someone's after you, someone's around the corner going after you, that's what it's really talking about. But um, today, we're going to talk about a runner, a notorious biblical runner, and his name is Jonah. This is our final uh, week of the 2021 edition of Greatest Hits of the Bible. We will come back to this in 2022, Lord willing. And we are going to talk about a story that's uh, perhaps familiar to many of us, if not all of us. There is a preacher that was telling the story of Jonah in a children's uh, sermon. And if you're not familiar with what that is, in some churches, they'll, uh, the children will all gather around at the front and the preacher will tell a story or a little antidote or have an object lesson or what have you. And so he's telling the story of, of Jonah and how uh, Jonah was swallowed by a fish and that um, after three days, the, the fish vomited uh, Jonah out onto dry land, and then Jonah went on his way. And so he's, you know, doing a good job. He's interacting with the, the kids, and he's asking them questions, having them tell the story back. And then he kind of had a reflective portion of this kind of little talk he did. And he says, and so what does it tell us that Jonah was vomited out by the fish onto dry land, and one little girl just spoke up. She was enthusiastic and quick to hear and uh, quick, quick to respond and, and said it so that everyone could hear. And she said, it tells us that even a fish can't stomach a bad preacher. <laughs> Hopefully that won't be the case today, okay? Our goal is to keep our fruity pebbles down, all right? That's my objective, and I've accomplished that. Then, Lord, God, praise God. We'll praise God together. If you do have a Bible with you, turn to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. Uh, it's not so easy to find, okay? Uh, so take a moment to uh, f locate um, Jonah, and um, it's uh, in, in the prophets. And we are going to be sharing from the book of Jonah today. So Jonah is a, uh, it apparently is just not in my Bible today. Um, Jonah is a story that is about, uh, we, we've been in, you know, first and second Kings and Jonah seems like kind of far off because like I said, it, it's, it's in, you know, the, the, the prophets and in you, you're like, how is this, you know, even possibly uh, related um, to this time? And, and the truth is, is that it is in this time because we were talking about Elisha last week. And Elisha, if you read about his death, you'll read about it in 2 Kings chapter 13. But if you're in 2 Kings chapter 14, you'll read this. And I have this up on the screen for you. This is 2 Kings 14 verse 25. He, this is being about Jeroboam the second. He's the, going to now be the king of the northern kingdom of Israel at this time. Uh, was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Labo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through the servant. What does it say? Jonah, right? Spoken through the servant, Jonah, son of, what does it say? I'm a tie. Good. I don't know how to say it either. All right. The prophet from Gath, a heifer. All right. And so this is, uh, Jonah was a prophet um, in the time of Jeroboam the, the second. And what's kind of interesting about these prophets we read about in Kings and uh, in, in the book of Jonah, like Elijah, uh, you can go back to Nathan if you want, and, uh, but Elijah and Elisha especially and Jonah is that these prophets, you kind of hear about like their life, you know, you're about like events unfolding in their lives. But 
you know, as you're turning the prophets, if you read the book before Jonah, like Obadiah, <laughs> um, I don't know how many people choose to read Obadiah, but uh, if you're reading Obadiah or you're reading Isaiah or Micah or Malachi, um, it doesn't, it's not much about the prophet in their lives. It's, I mean, it will talk about, you know, some, maybe their kids or their marriage or things like that, and, but that's all to reflect on the message. And when you read through those prophetic books, it's just like these a prophetic proclamation, like, thus says the Lord, you know, over and over again. But Jonah's different in the, in, in the series of these prophets because Jonah is an episode in his life, a familiar episode um, to us, and that's what we're going to look at today. So if you're in Jonah, if you did find it, chapter 1, verse 1, the, f- the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Mat- Amittai, uh, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach against it because of its wickedness, because its wickedness has come up before me. So who are the Ninevites? The Ninevites are ultimately Assyrians. And so um, they're neighbors, they're adjacent to the northern kingdom of Israel. In fact, in 2 Kings 14, 25, where it said Jeroboam II had taken over some of the land, some of that land was land that the Assyrians maybe some Ninevites, had once taken because the northern kingdom of Israel and these Ninevites or Assyria are just often in battle back and forth. On top of that, they're, so they're enemies, right? Right away, Ninevites are enemies of, of Israel. Secondly, they're a wicked people. They are merciless in war. They're barbarians. The prophet Nahum would say that it described the city, specifically of Nineveh, as a city of blood, a city that's never without victims, a city that has endless cruelty. And so the Ninevites were evil, and because of their sins, they were not only enemies to Israel, but enemies of God. And so these, uh, some text tells us that the Ninevites were those who skinned their enemies alive. They, they worship false gods. They dove down into all sorts of depravity. And I think if we're going to relate to the story of Jonah, we first must ask ourselves, who are our Ninevites? For the Israelites, the Ninevites describe someone they couldn't stomach. Who is someone you can't stomach? You might say, well, I don't have any enemies. Okay, who do you not like? Who irritates you? Who, when you hear their name, makes your face turn a certain shade of red? And some, I could just, you know, maybe mention a current or past uh, political official, and that might happen to you, okay? Or a political party, and it just rouses you up. For some of you, it might be the Minnesota Vikings or Chicago Bears, or anybody that plays the Wisconsin Badgers, all right? And for some of us, it's things like abortion doctors and Uh, In the past, it might have been Osama bin Laden or uh, Al-Qaeda or ISIS. Some of us might think of human traffickers. Who are your, who are our Ninevites? Who's on your list? Who who makes your blood boil at the the mention of their name, the sight of their face, or the, the group that they identify with? And now, when you think of that, when that that name or that person comes up in your mind, this is the question that we need to ask. And I think we all automatically know the answer, but we often don't ask the question, what does God think of these people? What does God think of that person, that man or that woman? Let's take for a moment, look at the Ninevites. What does God think of the Ninevites. Well, first, God says they are wicked. Secondly, he says, Jonah, I want you to preach against it. And so when you're thinking about, you know, the, the people you don't like or the person you don't like, you might, on, the, on this point, you might be like, all right, you know, like, yeah, they are wicked, and yeah, let's go preach against them, you know, and we're kind of on, on board. But what does he mean by preach against it? Well, we get clarity in Jonah chapter 3, when, 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 when Jonah eventually gets there, he gives them a harbinger, and he tells them they are about to be overthrown. And so ask this question, why did God give Nineveh a warning? Why would God give Nineveh a warning? Why would God send one of his messengers to them and give them the opportunity to repent? 
And here's, you know, the, the book's titled Jonah. Jonah is in all four chapters, but the book is really about God and who he is. The reason that God is sending Jonah is because of who God is, not because of who the Ninevites are. And who is God? God is a God full of mercy and full of compassion. And so why did God send Jonah? Because God loves the Ninevites. And so as you think about that name, that group, that person, that face on your list, I want us to consider not what we think about them, but what does God think about them? How does God feel about them? And the truth is, no matter who they are, because it was true for the Ninevites, God loves them. God loves them. So where was Jonah's heart when he hears this command? Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. I have a question. Who was, what, what does the text say about who Jonah was running away from? The Lord. He was running away from God. It wasn't because he was afraid of the Ninevites. It wasn't, this is not a story about Jonah running away from Nineveh, though he literally was. It's a story about Jonah running away from God. He went the opposite direction of Nineveh as fast as he could. Could and he's doing so in direct disobedience to God, and he'd rather run away, not only in the opposite direction of Nineveh, but really away from God and in Israel and, and, and everything he's known. He's had this ministry in the northern kingdom of Israel, and he's like, I am leaving it. I rather leave than even give Nineveh a chance. In fact, he keeps on running. I mean, he runs farther than Forrest Gump because when he gets to the sea, he keeps going. Okay, he jumps on a boat. And now you and I, you know, I, I don't know anybody that's like, you know, uh, today I'm going to go uh, take go fishing out on the Chippewa. And, and you, you think, man, you're such a dangerous daredevil. You know, you know, we don't really think that. Right. But sailing 2,500 years ago wasn't an automatic. Everything's going to be fine. It was a dangerous thing. And so he puts his life on, he was willing to put his life on the line, put himself in peril instead of obeying God. And so that leads me to a second question as we think about the story of Jonah, is what happens when you run from God? And the truth is, I think every single one of us could just take turns coming up here and telling the answer to that question. Some of you maybe right now, could answer that question with what you're facing. What happens when we run from God? We see this in Jonah's life. We see this in our lives. Three things happen. One, we go to the dumbest places. Two, we end up self-destructing. And three, we end up hurting those people, or, or we end up hurting people close to us. So Jonah runs to a dumb place. He, he jumps into a boat into the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. Secondly, Jonah begins to... Uh, self-destruct, and third, he begins to hurt those around him. When he gets on the boat, sure enough, he faces this terrible storm. The boat is sinking. The sailors are willing to throw their livelihood overboard. They're just throwing the cargo, just hoping that the boat can make it. They're just praying to the, their own gods, just wishing for the storm to stop. Jonah's disobedience puts the sailor's life in danger. His his running away from God is affecting those around him. Eventually, Jonah is running away from God so hard that he self-destructs, and he's willing to die. He's not going to help Nineveh. He's not going to obey God. He just says, kill me now. When we read the story, we don't, and because we know the ending, we sometimes don't really see the gravity of that. He tells them to throw me overboard. He says, throw me overboard. And it's going to solve all your problems, all right? Well, throwing your, your, having someone throw you overboard in the Mediterranean during a storm where you're about to lose your ship is a death sentence. And Jonah knew that full well. 
The sailors knew that full well. Just before they throw Jonah overboard, they say, Lord, don't hold us against us that we're killing this man. In Jonah chapter 2, he describes that time of going out into the sea as going down into the realm of the dead. Seaweed was wrapped around his neck. He was going to be buried under earth forever. When we face many circumstances, and we face difficult circumstances when we, when we run from God, and folks, we've all run from God at some point in our lives. Uh, for some of you, this was a gradual thing. You know, you were maybe sprinkled as a, as a baby. Your parents did that, and, and you went, and you were confirmed, and, and that was, you know, what you were supposed to do. Like, you went, that, that's what you were, were, were to do. But then, like, in high school or maybe in college, you just kind of stop going to church. And, and maybe it was like, I did the church thing. I tried that. Uh, maybe it just all of a sudden didn't become a priority, and other things became a priority. Um, and maybe it was deliberate. Maybe it was just kind of happened slowly over time. Yet something good or something bad happened and it caused you to turn around. Sometimes when, when people have children, they realize, you know, oh, you know, I need to get my life back together and with the Lord. Sometimes it's when there's a death in the family or a diagnosis or you get to the end of your rope and you realize, man, I, I need to turn back to God. I, I, I know that I need to go to him. And maybe this morning you haven't quite come back yet. Uh, and God has you here listening for some, some reason, and I believe he has a reason. Well, you're in the right place. You have an opportunity today to go back to God and turn back to him. And sometimes our running from God isn't as gradual as more intentional. We'll say, yeah, Jesus, you are Lord, except for this area of my life. Some of us have an area of our life, if we knew, if a brother or sister in Christ knew what was going on in the exact area of life, we know exactly what they would say about it, that it wasn't right, or we need to do the opposite, or stop, or whatever it might be. That, that if God, you know, we kind of hide it from God. Like, if God saw this, we know we would have to make a change. Like, God, you, you're Lord of everything else, but this area of life, I just kind of want to do what I want to do. And you're running away from God in that particular area in your life. Maybe it's a relationship that's not God-honoring. You know, you're dating somebody that is not a believer, and, and they're taking you down, down a path that you know that God wouldn't want you to go down. Uh, maybe it's not a God-honoring relationship because you're married, and it's someone else that you're texting or something like that. And you say, you know, this is, this is my, don't touch this, God. This is my area, and, 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 and I want to do this. Uh, maybe it's in your job, and you're taking a few shortcuts that are just, you know, are unethical, but, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, no one knows, no one's going about it, and, and I'm just going to run away from God in this one little area. There's, there's sometimes often areas in our life that we're selective and we don't relent, we don't surrender, we don't give up control. And so at one point, we've all been a runner. At one point, we've all run away from God. And if, so this morning, if you find yourself in that camp right now, you're in good company. And just like Jonah, man, we can go to the dumbest places when you're running from God. I mean, how many people, show of hands, how many people can say this, that you look back in your life, you know you did something that maybe God didn't want you to do, and, and, and you thought, man, how stupid was I? Anybody willing to admit that this morning? How st I want you to just kind of look around, okay? Look around, all right? We're a bunch of stupid people, Okay. <laughs> And so if you feel that way this morning, like, man, I am a stupid person the way I, where I've been, got myself into, you're in good company. All right? You're in good company. We, we have a church shirt made up that says, you know, we are imperfect people following Jesus. We are simply Christians. Um, so, so you're in the right place. All right? And, and what happens? You begin to self-destruct. Because when, when God is not at the center of your life, there's, there's this void there's this void because you need him there. You, when, when God's the center of life, everything makes sense. When God is the center of life, you have fulfillment. When God is at the center of life, you have peace. When God is at the center of life, you have joy. I've talked to so many people, you know, going through terrible circumstance, loss of a, of a daughter, going through court battles with their family. I mean, all kinds. And they say, you know what? And, because, and they point to their faith. 
I have peace. Through this all, I have peace. It is peace beyond understanding. Yet when God is not there, what do we do? We try to fill it. Try to, try to fill it that's going to make us feel satisfied or, or, or fulfill us or, or, or give us some sort of joy and peace. And we try to fill it with all kinds of things that cause self-destruction and end up hurting those around us. I myself experienced the shrapnel of the choices of my father. Now, thankfully, he's a redeemed man of God and he's, he, he honors God in his life. But at one time... He didn't. And I've seen too many children be on the receiving end of the shrapnel of the choices that their parents have made. And so when we run away from God, we hurt those around us. Maybe you're a single adult or a, a teenager and you're, you think your parents overreact when, they're dating, when you're dating a certain person. And here's the reason why they're, they're overreacting is because they see that person running away from God and they care about you and they don't want you to get hurt. They don't want you to experience the fallout of that person's life. And so we, here we have Jonah. He's run away from God. His body is sinking into the depths of the sea and Jonah is just getting what he deserves. You, you disobey God, you, you sin. The, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and that's what's happened. He, he's dying. And, and, and it's, it seems like it's over. In fact, the sea for Jonah is a watery grave. Jo Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord provided a huge fish. Some of you would be surprised it didn't say whale. <laughs> Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So despite Jonah deliberately disobeying God, despite Jonah who seemingly rather die than help those Ninevites, Despite Jonah and the sailors thinking, oh, this storm must be because God wants me dead. Despite all of that, God rescued Jonah. God provided a miraculous and unique vessel. He provided a living boat. He provided a living submarine, and he provided it to rescue. I don't know if anybody else was in the story, but when I recalled the story from like VBS as a kid in Sunday school. I had the privilege of growing up in, in church and, and, and I'm so thankful to God for that, my family for that. But I thought the moral of the story was if you run away from God, you'll get eaten up. You know, that's kind of what I thought the moral of the story was like, don't run away from God, you're going to eat up, right? But this large fish was not swallowing Jonah for supper. He was swallowing Jonah for shelter as a savior. And so here's the moral of the story. And I think someone here needs to be hear this or perhaps be reminded of this. God doesn't give up. God doesn't give up. <laughs> Everything that Jonah did God didn't give up on him. And it's not just about Jonah, but it's the Ninevites. Despite all their wickedness, despite his messenger just running away and saying, I'm not going to be a part of it, God hasn't given up on them either. God, once again, is a merciful and compassionate God. He moves in unexpected and powerful ways. And we may try to run away from God. We may give up on him, but he does not give up on us. God does not abandon us. 
And so Jonah experiences the mercy and compassion of God. And after spending three days in the belly of the fish, it reminds me of a story we're going to talk about in a couple weeks on Easter Sunday. After spending three days in the belly of the fish, jo- Jonah is vomited out on a dry land because even a fish can't stomach a bad preacher. Amen. Uh, we see that Jonah is the o- not the only one who experiences the mercy and compassion. God doesn't give up. So Jonah chapter 3 now, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. God is a God of second chances. God doesn't give up. Came a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave you. I give you, excuse me. Verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Noah, now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. The first thing I want us to notice is that only after all these terrible things, like he's Facing the storm, he is drowning to death. It was only then that Jonah was ready to turn back to God and be obedient to him. And it's often life circumstances. It's often when we're suffering. It's often when we're at the end of the rope that is exactly the point where we are ready to turn back to God and be obedient to him. And God is ready God is ready for you to come back. He doesn't, he doesn't give up. Secondly, God still hasn't given up on the Ninevites. His plan all along was to show mercy and compassion to the Ninevites. And despite everything that's happened, that plan is still fully intact. When Jonah goes and he pre- preaches the message, immediately the city responds. Immediately they believe in God. They repent of their sins, even the king. And chapter 3 tells us that, that Jonah was warning that their city would be overthrown, but that because of their response to the Lord's message, that he relented and they would not be overthrown. And this is quite really amazing. Nineveh didn't, didn't I mean, Nineveh, Nineveh deserved judgment. And now they're not getting what they deserve. And God used this narrow-minded man by the name of Jonah. And and God's rescue of Jonah wasn't just a rescue of Jonah, but it was also a rescue of the Ninevites, ensuring that they would hear the word of the Lord. Folks, God doesn't give up. This is true for you. This is true for your friends. This is true for your neighbors, your coworkers, your family. And this is true for those on your Ninevites list. God doesn't give up. I want to share a couple passages with you, and I just want you to hear the heart of God in these passages. Romans 5, 8 says this, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we're still sinners, while we're running away from God, while we're in our wickedness, Christ died for us. And then listen to the heart of God in this passage in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some of you understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Folks, I know we all want to see Jesus come back. I am so ready, and I am so excited. And part of the reason that God hasn't yet is because he wants more people to come to him. And so as we are excited for Jesus to come back, we need to get serious about proclaiming the message of the gospel because God's heart in these passages is that God loves the Ninevites. God loves those who run away. God demonstrates his love for us that while we're still sinners, he sent Christ to die for us. So we know God's heart. God is a just, he's a merciful, he is a gracious and compassionate God. But what about Jonah? Jonah. I mean, we know Jonah was willing to obey the Lord, but Jonah still thought it was ridiculous that the Nineveh, Nineveh wouldn't get destroyed. He thought that, yeah, okay, I'll go preach the Lord, and it's great that they repented, but they're still going to get what they deserve, right, God? And so Jonah experienced grace, but he wasn't willing to extend it to others. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4 is kind of the story that we don't always hear about. You know, we just kind of usually hear about, okay, the whale vomited up for fish, vomited up Jonah, he proclaimed it, they repented, end of story. But chapter 4 is really telling. Verse 1, but Jonah, so this is right after it says, 
Nineveh wasn't going to be destroyed. But Jonah, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry, and he prayed to the Lord, isn't that what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that, and listen, he says this like this is a bad thing. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Who is Jonah mad at again? God. He's mad that he's a, God is a God that doesn't give up. He's mad that God, God is uh, uh, gracious and, and, and merciful. And so Jonah is it being selfish. Jonah is being narrow-minded. You see, rescue is just fine for him, but not for Nineveh. I mean, the, the, the Assyrians, they were Israel's enemy. And, and, and so Jonah's thinking, why, God, would you do such a thing? <laughs> Reminds me of a story of a, a Christian boy talking to his friend about becoming a Christian. And he says, you know, you, you can go to heaven if you follow Jesus. And his friend says, oh, so all I have to do is follow Jesus and go to heaven. If my mom uh, wants to go to heaven, all she has to do is follow Jesus. And the Christian friend said, yeah, and if you don't want her to go, just don't tell her. <laughs> so Jonah didn't want to tell him in the first place, right? Jonah didn't want... Nineveh to experience heaven. I mean, there's the turn and burn message, but, but Noah just wanted the burn message. I mean, no, 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 no. Jonah just wanted the burn message, you know? Burn, baby, burn. I mean, that's what he what was, was doing. In fact, do you know what Jonah does? He's, I mean, God already told him what's going to happen, but Jonah is so insistent that Nineveh is, is going to get what they deserve, you know? He runs a quick trip and gets his, his, his pop and bananas and stuff and, and, and glaciers, and, and he gets a camping chair, and he goes outside the city, and he sets it up, and he's just waiting. You know, he's just waiting for that city to, to burn, that, that, for that city to be destroyed. I wonder how long he was planning on waiting, but, but we actually don't know how long he did wait. But anyways, God does something interesting. The sun is, like, coming down, you know, and, and Jonah's out there waiting for this city to burn. He's being so you know, vindictive and, and everything towards the Ninevites, and, and, and the sun's coming down, and it's kind of scorching him, and he's kind of getting mad, you know, and sweating, and really uncomfortable, and God does another miraculous thing. He causes this plant to shoot up out of the ground and provide him shade. We all like to have shade or something like that when we're hot. In fact, I have a picture of this uh, moment uh, when he's out there and he provides shade. It's right here. I don't know how well you can see that, but that's uh, Bernie Sanders down there uh, at the uh, inauguration. So uh, there's a time where that uh, meme was going around. I didn't share any of them until this one today. So I realize it's three months old in old news, but um, I don't know. I don't think Jonah really looked like that, by the way. But, uh, and it wasn't a tree either. So the picture's just really off in, in, in a lot of ways. It was a gourd or a plant that, that grows up. He, he provides him um, shade. And here's the thing. Jonah loved it. I mean, it was like a glass of ice water on a hot summer day. It was like jumping on the, laying down on the air conditioning vent, you know? I mean, he just loved it. He's like, oh, this is so great. I'm, you know, I'm, this is like the best, most comfortable I could be while I'm about to watch Nineveh get destroyed. Or so that's what he thought. And then God does something else kind of miraculous. That plant just, just gets destroyed just like that. And, and Jonah gets angry about the plant being destroyed. One commentary says this, quote, Jonah insisted in the strongest terms possible that the gourd was important to him. It was significant in his eyes. He loved it. It delighted him. And now that is dead, he is furious. He feels enough anger at the loss of a plant to prefer death to life. And so Jonah is so concerned about this plant, but God reminds Jonah that he's concerned about people. So chapter 4, verse 9. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also so many animals, and it ends in a question. That's the end of Jonah. Why is that the case? Why does it end with the question? Here's, here's what I think it's doing. It's saying, God's saying, I have clearly shown you who I am. 
I'm a God that doesn't give up. I'm a God that's gracious and compassionate and merciful, not only to you, but to your enemies. And so the question at the end is really not a question about God, because it's already clear what the answer is to that. The question is about us. Are we going to share that heart and that concern that God has? You see this concern in the life of Jesus. Luke 19, 41 says this, And he, speaking of Jesus, approached Jerusalem and saw the city, and he wept over it. And I think it's important for us to take time to reflect on places where it says Jesus wept, or Jesus was angry, or he shows some emotion, he was disappointed. I think it's important for us to stop and take a moment and say, what does this mean? What does this tell us? He, he was weeping over Jerusalem. He talks about how it's going to be destroyed by the Romans. He's kind of prophesying. But it's not just that the stones are going to be on the ground. It's that they've rejected the Messiah. They didn't recognize that he's there for them to save them, that he's weeping over Jerusalem because they're lost. And so as we reflect on do we have the heart of Jesus, do we have the heart of God as displayed in the book of Jonah, just like Jonah ends with a question, I want to end with a question. Have you wept over the lost? Have you ever wept over your neighbor who doesn't know Christ? Have you ever wept over those in your apartment or your dorm or your school that are lost? Have you wept over the 43,090 people in the Chippewa Valley that don't know God? I don't know about you. But I'm sure glad that the person that introduced me to Jesus had the heart of God, not the heart of Jonah. Let's pray together.